This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. A fun podcast today. Larry Heights, one of the best trend-following traders of all time. Originally featured in the book, Market Wizards by Jack Schwager. Featured in my book, Trend Following. Featured in my book, The Little Book of Trading. Featured in my film, Broke. Today, Larry comes on in support of his new book, his first book after all of these years. The Rule, How I Beat the Odds in the Markets and Life, and How You Can Too. I've had so many conversations with Larry, hours and hours of unreleased recordings. I'm going to have to put those all together into a mega, mega episode. But in the meantime, please enjoy my most recent conversation with Larry Heights. I have listened to all of your podcasts. Not because you're a friend of mine, because I happen to like the subjects. You have really interesting guests. You've gone way beyond trend following, but you've gone and you've broadened it out. That's good. Do, do you think sometimes, though, that the style of guests and their thinking, though, does connect to trend following sometimes, that they're just good thinkers? Yes. That is true, because most of the people who are good at at speculation have a um, very practical way of going about things. Because, you see, there's no magic in trend following. What it does to you is kind of magic, but it's not like Catholicism, where, where you know, some magic. Is going to happen to you just because you accept Christ. No, trying to follow him says these are the facts. These are the way that people are, are voting. I mean, the best thing I ever read about trying to follow him was your article of Jeff on uh, Jeff Bezos. We talked about that a lot. Why do you, why don't you refresh the audience? So it was a, it was a Jeff Bezos article. People can find it. Uh, it was a guy that had uh, uh, collected all of Bezos's newsletters or his shareholder uh, letters that went out and there was and then I did a little bit of a uh, a podcast on it and you really liked it but it was basically trend following 101 wasn't it yes but one of the problems is there's a, a group of people mostly academics that reject anything that's simple this because their job to make themselves more is to be a priestly class. A priestly class. Yes. I don't know what religion you were brought up in. Yeah, I mean, look, it, look when you, you said Catholic, though. You know, you could be picking on any religion. Your point, your point is just this, the faith thing, the religion thing, and you're saying that mentality doesn't work with your line of work. Yeah, because I'm not going to get what I want by praying. I'm going to get what I need by examining the facts and living with it. I mean, a lot of people do not like trend following, Michael. They just don't like it. And they don't like it because it's accessible to anybody. I'm living proof that you can get very rich doing very simple things. I tell you what, before we dive in too much, let me just start with the kind of the opening question, the opening thought for this conversation. You are now a first-time author. How does it feel? A big responsibility, and I have to becoming an author is an enormous responsibility. In what way? Tell me. Because I have to explain what we're doing, 
is not just about making money. I have to explain to people how this works because I wrote a book. I saw the galleys and the hardcover is on its way to me, but I saw a picture of the hardcover. It looks really nice. Yes, they did a very good job. But it is. It goes back to, to your trailers. Credit filing really is an answer in all kinds of markets. It's the absolute truth. You mean writing a book too, what, whatever? Yeah, writing a book was harder because I had to learn to speak well and I had to articulate a very simple but very robust method. It's very hard for people to believe that. They want bells and whistles and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, they want computer news, they want... I mean, I started my credit following, and most of the people that we know, like Dunn, myself, we did it on paper. John Henry, I used to do it the same way. A Lotus 1-2-3 spreadsheet. Yes, basically. So I had a friend of mine, very high guy, came from Bell Labs, he said, Larry, this can't possibly work. He says, look, how much is a computer? $3,000, $4,000? If you could do this with a computer, anybody could do it. I said, yeah, turns out it does work. But hold on. When you say anyone can do it, though, that's kind of why you wrote the book. I mean, it's the psychology. It's the philosophy. It's the inside Larry Height that stuck with it. So when you say anyone can do it, as long as they stick with it like you. Yeah, look. The true thing is, if you go look at t- late night TV, late night television would help, would tell you that the majority of people are fat in America. And there's a big industry getting people skinny. Now you think about it. I mean, how hard could it be not to eat? That's the deal. Now, I have to have problems with it. But the point is, we have a lot more computers, but we're not very far from David Ricardo. You know what? That's a great place to jump into. As the audience may or may not be aware of, the title of your first book is called The Rule. I happen to have had the good fortune to be on the phone with you when you named it The Rule. I don't want to go into all the other titles that were discussed, but... You seem to be a little bit, I don't, frustrated is maybe not the right word, but you were kind of weird going round and round. Everyone was giving input to you about titles, and you were on the phone with me, and you just said, the rule. That's it. And what is the rule? As you mentioned, David Ricardo. It's what David Ricardo said about 400 years ago. Cut your losses and let you win as well. In fact, what you really should do, if you want to get, you get wealthy if you do that. But you'll get really rich is after you cut your losses, you take that remaining to the winners. I'm so clarify that, Larry. You kind of dropped out for a second. Okay. You're going to cut your losses. Anybody can do this. Take 10 of anything that's trading on an exchange, any kind of exchange, doesn't matter. So you have 10 of these things. Five of them. They hit the stops, which is the safety. You have to do that, do this correctly. You have to cut your losses. But what I have found, you really get richer when you take those losses and put them back into the winners. And I'm taking about randomly taking ten things. Well, so what you're saying is the money that becomes those losses, you can't get emotionally attached to it. Just because it was a loss, it, you have to be ready to get back and play again. Yeah. Yeah, because that's true. Enough. Because you you know something about it. You had a guest on. He said he buys new hoods. Well, I, I tested that for years. I don't think it works. And it's not a big magic thing. Look, it's in the just a few weeks, there's a new high. That new high, that told you something. That in one year, this particular futures contract or stock 
haven't got my head. It ain't been there before. All you got to do is jump on it with a stop, and you get rich. And I think about it, got as bad grades as I did. Right? I had learning disabilities. I had a lot of other problems. But I could take this and apply it, and I've got close to $100 million. Let's put a pin in that for a second, and let's stay at the title, The Rule, for a second. And just to be clear so everyone understands that the David Ricardo original mantra of, you know, never refuse an option when you get it, cut short your losses, let your profits run on, that 1700s wisdom, I think, from the economist David Ricardo out of London, that 1700s wisdom was why you said, let's call your first book The Rule, because that's the rule. Yes. Yes, exactly. It's obvious, and you're pretty much a, you're kind of an interesting guy in the sense that you say things, and there's a lot of depth behind it, but as you pointed out so far in this conversation, it's simple sounding. So what was your process for coming up with the two-word title, The Rule. What, what, what popped into your mind? How, how did that happen? Was it literally just me and you bantering and you just said The Rule and that's it? Something like that. It worked. If you're a poor kid, I don't mean poverty, but I mean, you're a kid. You're, you're, you're like 90% of the people you have on your show are college graduates. So they didn't come the many people but most of the trend followers that stuck to trend following have become wealthy people. But if you compare it to the population, I think it's an astounding thing. Let's talk about the reason why, though. I mean, everyone sees the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I mean, that's easy to see. I mean, you mentioned it already. You said, okay, you know, you've had a long career and you've hit some milestones on the... Uh, the net worth uh, meter that looked pretty good to the average guy who's not yet hit it. What's the ground level? If you had to take it back to when you were 10 years old, 12 years old, a teenager, what were those things that you were putting in motion? The Larry Height process back when you were a teenager, what were some of those things that you were putting into motion that became the foundation for Larry Height, the adult making trading decisions? Because I know the way that you are today was set in motion when you were a young person. Yes, because I had a goal. And because I had a goal, I found a simple way to do it. And I could test it. If I didn't have a computer, I could go back and look at the numbers. So here you have this thing, you know, and there are the results. You take a idea of having to stop buying the breakout. And you could test it. He can go to the library and you can go back 20, 50 years. So it was testable. And that was a big thing. It wasn't it wasn't a mystery what you do. The mystery is that it makes you so rich. But in reality, what you have to do, it's kind of like if you don't eat. You don't get fat. Now, we have a whole diet regimen that people sell all the time. But what you got to do is not eat. You want to speculate, you have to cut your losses. Because you don't know how big the losses are. Hey, let me, let me keep you at that younger Larry for a second. And tell me how much psychologically. I mean, I get these, maybe you're going to give me another just straightforward answer. That's fine. But you were an underdog who was not a quitter. You know, you were an underdog who kind of said, okay, you know, I've got these disadvantages. So what? And you just kept plowing ahead. What choice do you have? If you're like me, you're dyslexic, you're blind in one eye, possibly and your family says you've got to be successful. You have to find a way. You don't have a choice. People who quit have a luxury. If you're poor enough, and I don't mean starving, I mean like lower middle class, like 99% of the world. 
and you want to achieve something, you see the way you can do it. And I understand that this is doable. The math being a certain system is not complicated. You want to know if the market's going up and down? Go look at that average. It's really that simple. So if you're a kid and you really get wealthy, you're going to look for something that you can do that's doable by you. Larry, what do you say to people? I mean, some markets obviously require some capital. You can't go in broke. Put aside the markets. My question here is not only market related, but what do you say to people where they say, you know, I really don't have the money to start the venture. I really don't have the money to be the next entrepreneur. I need money first. I need money. I hear this a lot. What comes to mind when you hear that, when people are saying that in order for them to take action, they must have what they imagine is some some certain amount of capital that's going to equal success? The truth is you get the money need. Just because you need it is big enough. So you're going to show people how this works. You have your tests. For years, I only walked around with the tests. And you can see that this is what you do. You know, I can put it, what do you do if you don't do that? Yeah, that's kind of where I was going is because I think ultimately if someone says, I can't do something in my life, whatever that something is, if I can't do something, Without the money, they're pretty much saying, I quit before they ever start. Yeah, and you can get five friends to chip in. Literally, I started this idea. As you know, if I take 10% of the profits and I got people to put in the other 90%, and I'm going to, by charging 20% of the profits, I'm going to be getting 30% of the profits, but I had to get up enough money to be able to go the, get the advantage of going across the border. You're well known for pulling together this like first billion dollar fund back in the day. Now, for you to do that, you must have had a very good way with people. People trusted you. They liked your ambition. They liked your drive. But what could be something that you could explain to other people when they are looking to perhaps either to friends or other associates, if they're looking to pull capital together for their venture, whatever that venture might be, trading, new startup, whatever, what is a piece of advice that you could give to the audience about dealing with people and presenting yourself? Like, how did you do it? I found that I could build a model and I could show people the results of the model and that was important what did you do personally though I mean what was the way that you was it just I mean look like everyone can hear you right now they can hear the Larry personality was it just that you're the same guy in this conversation that you were showing the model and that was it yes because I believed in the numbers I could see how this could work I don't know why Certain people see trend following works. They just got it. They get it. The first, I, the first time I saw it, I could just see mathematically how this hang, hung together. What was your first thought to yourself, though, when you saw that it just hangs together? What did you feel to yourself when you had that aha moment? I said, aha, I have a way to get rich. And I didn't know how rich I'd get. There were like about six of us who were into trend following. I said, honestly, in my head, I did thousands of using the prices that I got out of the library and stuff and saw that it worked. By the way, there is nothing wrong with work. Even if you're doing Hard scrabble, taking the stuff out of the newspapers. You put it together and you test it. 
And that's where you get confidence in what you're doing. It's funny that you're talking about the hard scrabble work because as you talk about in your book, you took all kinds of entrepreneurial jobs. I think there was one with a kind of like redoing doors or something. I mean, you, you, you know, we're talking about big money right now and we're talking about trend following trading, but for you to get your start, you didn't have an ego in it. You were doing whatever you had to do to get there. Exactly. Because I had to get there. Why did you have to get there, Larry? Why? Because my, my father would not have taken any excuse. Did you like him at the time for that? Or was it only over time you appreciated that no, attitude? No, I right? loved him. Even though he couldn't do it, he said, you're going to do it. And I don't know how you're going to do it, but you're going to do it. And so not only did I take him, I supported him, my grandmother, grandfather, some cousins. I did for the family what I could do. And that's what was my job. I was willing to do that. Now, does it ever strike you when you go down this entrepreneurial path for decades and you're, you're basically a self-made guy and you hear maybe somebody comes on the media or the news and they start talking about evil speculators. You, Larry Height, are an evil speculator, right? No, I'm a logical person. If that's evil, I don't pray what what I do trade. I stick to a method. I've tested my method. So I don't care what they think. I care, am I making money at this? Because that's my job. I had my mom, my father, my grandparents. I had people to support. So I had to do this. It's not a question that I wanted to do it. Well, it turns out people liked it. You could make money without physical labor. That's tough for a lot of people to accept, though. It's Because it, unless you're exposed to it, unless a Larry Height tells you, hey, by the way, you can use your mind to make money while you sleep, people from the physical labor side of the equation often don't hear somebody tell them that. You're telling them that now in your book, but a lot of people don't hear that. I saw proof of it. I saw, I did thousands of simulations by hand. And I saw that I could work. My boss, who was not bad at it, but he never took it to where he He always changed the system. He was always fiddling with it. But it really wasn't bad because he's always cutting his losses and going into the next winners. And that was the secret sauce. The great thing about trend following is your losses are gone. When you make the choice to get out of your losers, then you've opened up a Pandora's box of good stuff. Because you're going to have, if you start off with 10 positions, you're going to have like five really good positions that you've added to. And you make money doing that. You know, but Larry, if I go, if I go on Twitter right now, I can find some of the most well-known Wall Street quote professionals. And they all have an opinion about what's going to happen. And they tie themselves, they tie their underwear in knots to be right. They have to be right. They want their audience to feel them being right. And you're telling me, eh, losses. You know, if you could take the losses, then you're okay. You're sitting here telling the audience loud and clear, if you're trying to be right, it's going to fail. Correct. I have one eye that doesn't work that well. I'm dyslexic in my good eye. So I had to find a way to use the tools that were open to me. And by the way, that happened. I don't know anybody. The one partner I had, and he was a very, very smart guy. He had all kinds of scholarships and all, but he could not take the pressure of losing. I've been losing my entire life. 
you know, last time you were talking on on the radio, and you were talking about trash talking, and that's what you did as a catcher. You trash talked the batters. I don't know if you remember that. Oh yeah, I mean, and just to refresh on that, I was a young kid. I was maybe like seventeen. I remember trash talking a left-handed batter who was probably six foot three, 225 pounds. And I was probably six foot 170 pounds, but I talked a lot of, you know what? And I remember sitting there telling him exactly where the pitch was going to come and you can't hit it. You know, your mother's in the, is out there in the audience laughing at you. And I probably had a lot of F-bombs in there as well. And he just wanted to kill me, but you know, he struck out. Right. And it didn't bother you. It bothered me or bothered him. It bothered him, but it, look, you have gone to bat. Professional baseball player. What's a really good batting average? 300. Okay, so that means 70% of the time, they're wrong. And you're basically saying that guy that I was trash talking should have never been so emotional because you got to know from the beginning, 70% of the time, I mean, we're talking Moneyball 101 here, 70% of the time you're going home back to the dugout. And if you watch the professional hitters, most of the time they strike out and walk casually back to the dugout. And most of the time they don't have that emotional attachment at that high level, major league level. Yeah, because that's the game. This is like, uh, I, I did some boxing. I'm not particularly good at it, but you get into a boxing ring, it should be no surprise that the other guy wants to punch you in the nose. That's what he's there for. As you say that, what you're really saying with the uh, trash talking of my example and you talking about you know fighting the boxing matches, you're really pointing out that like, look, there can be the rules, and you know, but you got to have a stiff constitution here. This is playing for keeps. This is this is real. This is the real game. That's why they call it life. Life was never meant to be easy. You have some very good easy run, but I mean, baseball is. And I'm not an athlete, but you can see from the batting averages how people do it. What the numbers say. I'm not making up the numbers. How many people are 400 hitters? Ted Williams was the last one. What, 1941 or something? Okay. So the majority of people are under that. The average baseball player. And by the way, the guy that leads, he's really good. He's a very good athlete. Otherwise, he wouldn't be there. But at best, he's going to be 350, 400. 400 is not going to really be 400. You know, we, we would be amiss also if we didn't point out that one of your old trend-following associates from back in the day, John Henry, who then used his trend-following winnings to buy the Boston Red Sox and then turned the Boston Red Sox into a uh, more of a statistical wonder that went on to win three world championships since he has owned the team. Yeah. And he did that basically living in Florida. He wasn't there for every game. But there's something about trend following in the numbers that tell a story. And that story is true. Let me take you back to Jeff Bezos, though. I kind of moved you off that, and you'd brought it up, and I think it's a really important point from you. And I, I want to add a quote, and I'll let you run from it, from that article that you were talking about. And Bezos, one thing that he said was, and I think he was actually paraphrasing somebody else, but it was something to the effect of like, look, if you're offered a seat on a rocket ship, don't question the seat or which seat you're sitting in. Just get on. Right. That's exactly right. Just get on the rocket. A lot of people want to question it, though, right? They want to talk about why the rocket's going this way and all that other kind of stuff. You know, they are the rocket to go to where the rocket's going. And it's the only way you're going to get there. So that's your choice. If you don't try in baseball or girls or anything, love, you can have 100% chance if you understand you're a failure and you don't try. You'll always be correct. You'll always, you know, but if you just try, just as a, you will disrupt that those statistics. 
I'm not trying in this conversation so far to lead people down every line of your book. They're going to have to go check it out. That's, you know, it's uh, it's very motivational. But I think that's your real point in your book is you are taking, a, a, you know, all of your life stories to basically show people of a guy who's had ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs, but you keep pushing forward generally up. Right. I found a very good way to trade securities. Quite different than I thought it was, you know, but it's make me a lot of money. And I love that. You know, your commercial for your program, it really sums up life as I had it, as I know it. You change the probabilities just by going back. And if you just stay home and do nothing, then you don't change anything. And that's that's your real message. Your real message is challenging all of us to not just sit there. You're saying of all the all the disadvantages you had and you keep plugging away, you're humble about it. You're not saying big ego about it. You're just saying, look, here is a different way of thinking about it than perhaps most colleges will ever tell you. Yeah. Did you just mention colleges? Yeah. One of the things that happened, I had this short professor. I had to really, I was always left off. I always loved problems. So this guy, I so went in the summer to make up for an accounting class that I had a lot of business toxic accounting on the heart. So he said, you know, so he goes through the various financial things you could have, bonds, stocks, blah, blah, blah. And he says, you know, if they're really, people are crazy, not only do they have, do they buy themselves on 5% margin, but they borrow the money. Everyone in the class left. Made perfect sense to me. And that's how I made the first means. I figured out, hey, you know, you have this cash. And when you put that up for margin, you're going to get a return on that. So you're going to get something for that. And literally, that's how I became a millionaire. Doing exactly what the teacher said not to do. Let me give you a word in your Wall Street lexicon that I know you love, which is the word Bayesian, Bayesian statistics, the idea that each prior is building, you know, each next moment is building off the prior, an iterative type thing. Why don't you give the audience a feel for why Bayesian statistics is so important to you? Okay. To me, Bayesian statistics is what life is about. Because you don't know how you going to do in the next but you know what a series of them are going to do. And the only thing that you can count is how, think, think what trend following does. It, it offers you a series of shots. It doesn't guarantee that you're going to win, but it offers you a series of shots. So you, you can figure out where you're going to stand, and if you, and where you have to change that probability line. And, and, that, and they never mention this. When you take statistics in college and high school, they always come back to the deck. You know, the deck of 32 cards. But there's not really... What it is when you're a speculator, we have a series of bets. And what you do is you count how those bets go. And that's how you get your basic probability. Because a, a 300 hitter is not, gonna, is not going to hit 600 for very long. Maybe a day. The math is an average. We've talked about it before too, Larry. There are 
this trend following mindset, it applies to so many disciplines. We've been talking baseball, the money ball, the John Henry, but venture capital, movie financing, other sports like basketball. It's crazy. This this style of thinking that you were one of the pioneers in ha- has, for some niches of the world, really caught on. Some people have really taken to this trend following Bayesian cut your losses mentality. I don't think by any stretch the uh, majority of the world is there, but a lot of people have caught on to it and have applied it to a lot of other disciplines that must have been interesting for you to observe something that you've known about for decades and now to see other people apply it to other worlds. Oh, I was I was amazed. First of all, one of the things they did was I looked for I looked at things where they actually used Bayesian statistics. And I could see that you could make money with those statistics. And and it was a simple count. It was an average. So that everybody could do an average. Let me shift you to kind of a fun one. We joked about this one time in a conversation, and I actually wrote about it in your book. Your high school had a lot of interesting people that went to your high school. And so now I have to wonder, I don't think you've met him, but apparently Spock, Leonard Nimoy, went to your high school. Do you think some of that kind of logic rubbed off on you or something? Maybe I rubbed off on him. (laughs) There you go, right? (laughs) Spock has a complete Bayesian way of looking at the world. He can tell you exactly what he's doing. He will know how many times out of a hundred what he's got to do. And it's not a very hard thing because it's a mindset. And I found out that it works if you're running a gambling casino. It works if you do banking. It's a mathematical way of looking at the world, but you don't need a quadratic equation. That's an interesting point, because you mentioned earlier learning disabilities, specifically dyslexia. I don't think I have dyslexia. I think I've been pretty lucky in that sense, but I know a lot of very bright people do. What was that like? How did you perceive the world in the sense of like, okay, you've got dyslexia. This is making it tougher to learn. What did you have to learn to get around the dyslexia to get to the understanding and the achievement? Can you explain what it was like to go around that learning disability? I had to have what I call a cheat. I had to find a way to make sense of the world around me. But think about it. Think about it. You're 15 years old. And you can't hit a baseball. And you, and you can't catch a baseball. And you live in a ball-centered society. So you got to figure out a way around it. You know, you do not have to do that. I had a father who was not taking any excuses. He didn't care how I how I did anything. I had to get it done. I had to support him, my mother, and my grandma. Period. That's it. Things like peer pressure never really concerned you or bothered you. You were like, okay, I've got these limitations, and you just blew by them? Well, I lost so much. I was always the last kid chosen for baseball or the last kids of any sport, that was it. That, that's what I had. Look, you can argue with the world, but the world is still the world. So you figure out how to use what's in the world. That's it. Because you only got what you got. If you don't have it, you're going to have to find something to compensate. When you hear people today, whether they're young people, older people, it doesn't really make a difference. I don't think you're not, you're not really a confrontational guy. Maybe you'll try and lead somebody to water and it's, it's up to them whether or not they'll go. 
But when you hear people with excuses, I mean, I kind of get the feeling that writing the book was a little bit of your way to, to let people know, like when you've got an excuse, here's a better way to look at it. Yeah. Is they going to buy anything? So one of the great things about Trendfolk, and when I did it, we called it across-the-board Trendfolk, because you, you start every day. You didn't know what you were going to buy. You have all these futures in front of you. You take a shot, and then you got to go to the next shot. If that didn't work, you have to go to the next shot. You have to feed your family. So you're going to try. It, it's exactly like a peddler. Right? You, got, you know, I come from a family of peddlers. Hey, you might need to define for maybe some of the millennials out there that have been living inside video games for the last 15 years. Maybe you might need to define peddler for them. Immigrants, like my grandparents, got somebody to front them, front them, something like clothes or whatever, and they went door to door and they tried to sell it. That's what they did. That's what they peddled. I don't know why they call it peddling. Maybe they were on bikes. I don't know. But they basically went through the South or from door to door and said, okay, you know, yeah, and when I grew up, I'm older than you, there used to be a guy who used to walk in the, in the street and say, buy all clothes, buy all clothes. Selling the whole clothes. You didn't know who was going to do it. It's like when you go to a dance when you're a teenager, you don't know which girl is going to say yes or no. But after a while, if you have a little bit of math background, I say, you know, if I go to a hundred girls, I'm gonna get some. Well we've had that we've had that conversation many times. People sometimes don't think about their relationships like that, that you know, you're still gonna have a lot of strikeouts. The people that think they're gonna meet the the one lady or the one guy the first time, yeah, maybe you'll get lucky, but that's a bad way to run your life. Yeah, I think so. Explain why, the, the, the math behind it. Think about what happens at a dance. If you're kind of a goofy, blind guy, you, you blind guy like I am, and a girl says, no, I don't want to dance with you. You're a jerk. You know, whatever. You try one time, you go home crying, right? No, because you... Because I'm joking. <laughs> you don't have a choice to go home crying. So you look for another way. Try again. Try again. If you went to play baseball and you struck out once, would you quit the game? Some people maybe. Maybe they go through one season and they have a they have a down season and they they back out. As opposed to another kid might have had an okay season, but then he says to himself, you know what, I can be better and he works really hard in the off season and comes back the next year and he's better. It's what you've been getting at the whole and, and your book, your life. It's all it's the attitude. It's mindset. Correct. You know who H.L. Hunt was? The Hunt brothers? Yeah, no, but their father, H.L. I, I don't know him specifically, but you're going to tell me. I had someone a favor from Texas. They said, what was, how can we pay you back? I said, oh, if you knew H.L. Hunt, I would like to have lunch with him or buy him a cracker. I want to find out what he did. H.L. Hunt never was worried about a dry hole. Never. He figured he was mathematically very back. And he figured out there's an average. And I'm going to, the average is going to work for me. That's exactly what Trinidad was. That's exactly how romance works. That's how it works. That's the numbers. You know what I just love about your stuff, I love about you, is this this mentality is still rare today. The, the, the schools don't really talk about it. 
they really don't go there. The schools want to train kids like, you know, here's the sociology degree to allow you to get a job to make 30 grand working for the man for hopefully the next 30 years. It's this entirely different way of thinking than you've talked about for the last hour. I had no choice. You created yourself no choice. You could have taken a job for the man. Not really. Shuffling paper, doing something. Yeah, but I had a father who, although he wasn't wealthy, I was supposed to get wealthy. I am my father's son. Well, in a way that you get the ch- you get the chance right now in your career, after a long career, you get to a career that's continuing. You get the chance to, in your book, pass along a lot of that motivation from your father. You're giving it to other people. You know why I wrote this book? I wrote this book for my daughters. And I just wanted them to get what you just said. And you got to try. You change the odds just by getting up. And you have to do that. Because I will tell you, you will lose. That's it. You're going to have a loss. So you have to learn to live with that and move on and go get up again. And if you don't do that, you know, I was in London where we were Stanley Fink, who went on to be chairman of a band, and I got out of the car and I stumbled. I managed as I was stumbling turn that into a roll. I hit the ground, but I rolled and I popped back up. He said, that's incredible. How'd you do that? I said, I've had a lot of practice falling. When you're lying, that is what happens. You trip over shit. Hey, hold on. That's your first four-letter word in one hour. I had to wait 60 minutes to get a four-letter bomb from you. It's your first one. Was there some media training here? What's going on? Where's the real Larry? Who took the real Larry? Who stole him? Well, no. What he said, you can't curse. Oh, wow. Really? Well, there's not much cursing on this show, except if I'm talking by myself, sometimes I have a problem with the F-bombs. But as, as you know, I, I try to clean that up, though, because sometimes the people send me emails and they say, you know, you, you don't sound very nice. And I'm not doing it on purpose. It just happens. It fits well. Actually, cursing is a form of poetry. It delivers a lot of information. I've read a bunch of articles that said smart people cuss a lot, so I like to just tell that to myself and pretend. Okay, okay. But no, I mean, it, it, it brings in a lot of emotion. I mean, it's, I look, I mean, you know, you and I have had plenty of conversations where it's very raw and very direct. Those are great conversations. I've enjoyed those so much over the years. You know, we've got on the phone and talked about everything under the sun. And I I think in this conversation, you've shared a lot of that attitude that you share with me. You're sharing in this conversation. And I look at the end of the day, somebody listens to Larry Height for an hour and they're either motivated or they're not. I mean, (laughs) you can't drag them to the water. Right. And if they fail on day one, they pick themselves up. In the end, you've got to do what you got to do. Failure is not an option. Quitting is fatal. So you find, uh, I've had terrible jobs. I saw Bible door to door. That's frightening. And it was tricky to hood thing because I had to guess. East New York or wherever I was in Brooklyn, and I had to. It could be from the parish or from the, the Protestant. By the way, the guy who owned the Bible company was named Cone. That's interesting. It's really funny. You've had a perspective where you can look back over decades and you've watched behavior of people in general beyond, you know, musical tastes and clothing changes and all that kind of stuff. Do you think humans are pretty much the same? Or do you think that stuff like these phones and the internet have changed people in the last 25 years in a way? Of course they have. No, they haven't. They really don't. When prices go down, people get affected. Prices get up, they get affected. Because it's a hard mentality. And in fact, 
the more electronics we have, the more it all looks the same. I went back, going back to David Ricardo. I was looking at Earth trading. It was a very big bust. Some kind of fraud, something or another? Yeah, the big broke. It was a big thing in England. Everybody wants to own tulips. So I went back and I got the, I dug it up and I looked at the tulip data, made a chart. I, I, I like charts very much so. And charts talk to me. And I will tell you, if I were living there and if I could have got my trains off, I would have made a fortune on the up and on the down. Because I have no, I don't like either side particularly. Some of the smartest people in the day lost their shirts in that tulip thing. Yeah. That's because they weren't trend followers. I had a friend of mine who went out and made some movies. I said, you know, before I put on a trade, I know exactly where I'm going to exit if I'm wrong. He says, if, if I did that, I'd never make a movie. You've got to, you are going to make errors. That's a fact of life. Babies, when they learn to walk, they have a great attitude. So they fall down and they laugh and laugh and get up and try again. Those are my heroes. I don't know if you're referring to it directly, but do you remember the guest that I had on, Alison Gopnik, and she she talked about Bayesian babies? Yes, absolutely. No, I remember how very clearly I saw that. I thought I thought she was fabulous. Yeah, I got to get her on again. I mean, her and her whole point for the audience that's not following along is basically, basically babies, when babies learn, they just, if they find something that works, they keep going that way. They don't... They don't let go. They keep going that way. And that's a very Bayesian trend following mindset. Correct. But they're open. They're open. They don't have a a fixed view. They look at the world. They see everything in front of them and they try. They don't, they're they're not like adults that are scared yet. Well, they really, as they get older, especially early teens, they're very embarrassed when they fail. But failing is part of the game. You do know that you're thinking I mean, it's advanced, of course, but your attitude and passion is kind of like a teenager still. You know that, right? I, I wouldn't know that. It's a very practical way to be. Look, he's trying to do a movie. I bet you you've been told no 28 times. And you just look at that as information. This is all it really is. Why would you quit? It's like leaving a mark. I mean, you know, I think sometimes people get all caught up with, oh, you know, I've got a, I've got a pay this bill, buy this car, buy this 2.5 bathroom house. At the end of the day, there's got to be a, a passion, something you're, that's driving you where you're going to leave a mark. You know, I mean, and I, look, you've just done a great job of, I mean, you've done it with your career though too, but it's got to feel extra special. You mentioned your daughters. It's got to feel extra special to leave a mark in the form of a book because people are going to be reading that long after you and I are gone. I hope so. Well, I hope that they will read it. One of my daughters was just really good at school. It was just boom. She's very clear what she's there, what she's going to do, and she did well. So she walks in to be you. And he wants to take like um, a master's class. and But they talked to her for a while and they said, no, you're not going to get a master's class. You're going to sit here and you're going to get a PhD and we're going to pay for everything. She just had that skill. That's a skill. It's just like you can't be a very good baseball player if you're blind. But you could be a very good blind wrestler. But baseball would not be a sport for you. I think what you're doing there too is really interesting if people are not catching the nuance is that you can get these dreams about what you want to do, but you got to be observant of, you know, what your personal constraints are. 
And then once you know what your personal constraints are, the opportunities open up if you're wide-eyed. Correct. Absolutely. You got it in one. But you're living proof of it. What have you done? 800 podcasts? Larry, I'm just a guy somewhere in a fixed bunker location in Southeast Asia. That, and you're one of the few people that has actually been inside the Southeast Asian bunker. And it's a very weird place, right? It's very scary. You know, it's a very dangerous place with women that are wearing colorful dresses that are form-fitting, that look very terrible and unattractive, and everyone should stay away, right? Yeah, that's why I go back. No, somebody has to do it. Somebody has to do it. Yes, that's true. No, I'm looking forward to doing more. I mean, see, I think Asian kids, at least the ones I meet, come out to the lectures. They want to improve themselves. They're looking for a way. They don't work with excuses. They don't have excuses. They just say, we got to do it. No, no, yeah, yeah, no, no problem. We should remind people, I don't have the exact dates yet, but people can reach out to me, your website, which is lawrenceheight.com, my website. You're going to be coming to Asia in the new year to speak. So anyone that's listening, if you want some information, drop me a line, drop Larry a line. We'll fill you in on those dates when they become available. So... I'm looking forward to that. That will be fun. Hey, listen, I've kept you for a long time already. It's early morning out there. The book, The Rule, How I Beat the Odds in the Markets and Life and How You Can Too. All information at lawrenceheight.com. The book is on Amazon, everywhere to be found. People need to check it out. Thank you. I think it's practical stuff. It's one guy's journey through the jungle, telling people what he learned along the way, right? I mean, that's, you know, it's... Yeah, I keep trying. Larry, that's a great place to end it. I keep trying. Because if people stop trying, what happens? Nothing. Exactly. Zero. And you got to be somewhat indifferent to results. Good process. Let the outcome take care of itself, but have a good process. Absolutely. And by the way, think about you met some of the more important trend followers in the world. Can you name of any, any one of them that you've dealt with that didn't have that pro- process? That doesn't have the process or they all have the process? Yeah, trend following really does work. It works in every kind of business. You know, it's like I tell people, let's say I had a store. And you sell ladies' underpants, because that's what your family left you. You had this one store. And the store had red underpants and white underpants. Hold on. Is this, Victor- is this Victoria's Secrets, or you're, you're talking white underpants? I'm, t- I'm in the Victoria's Secrets. I don't know where you are. Okay. Well, I'm making it up as I'm going along. But the point is, ladies came in and just wanted to buy red. You wouldn't reorder white, would you? Not if they wanted red. Right. That's what you're going to do. That's why I thought your article on Jeff Bezos was so correct. In fact, there are a whole bunch of companies are now applying his methodology, which, which, by the way, is not new. It's David Ricardo 101. But in America, people used to get a big book from Sears Roebuck. Basically, what you what business is you get another version of Sears Roebuck. And it's a great, it's a great version because you don't have to cover the cash. But the ads in, the people come in with their credit cards, so you essentially finance your inventory. It's the richest guy in the world idea. We got to give him props for that, huh? But, you know, he makes the point, though, too. Inside of Amazon, like the Amazon itself was a great idea, but he's tried a lot of things. He's had a lot of small failures, and he'll say that. If you listen to him, he'll say, you know, listen, you guys see all the things we've done that are great, but you don't see a lot of the things that we've tried that we failed on. You don't see Abraham's failure. You look at the annual report. I wrote this book. I, I, I don't need money. 
right? Selling the book and going on the road is not going to make me any money. I'm, and I'm going to give it all away anyway. So what I'm doing it is to show kids like me that, yeah, there is a way. And you can't just because something doesn't work. You know, that, you know, every time you get in there, you're closer to the yes. And that's something that millennials don't seem to grasp. But it's something everybody should grasp. Listen, we're going to have to do part two of this conversation in Asia in person. I think it's even more fun when we can sit down and kind of chat that way. Let me just remind the audience as we go out, though, the rule, how I beat the odds in markets and life and how you can, too. The website, lawrenceheight.com. The book's out. Website's up. People need to go check it out. Larry, go enjoy that New York City morning and let's get that Asian trip rolling. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.